I have another budget bushcraft knife that I want to share with you. Today, it is the Adventurer from BPS Knives. If you're interested, keep watching. Just before we start the review, there's something I want to mention, and that is I've had this knife from BPS for a long time, much longer than I normally would carry a knife before doing the review. The reason I haven't done the review before now is, as you may be aware, BPS knives are made in the Ukraine, and BPS had sent this to me prior to the Russian invasion. Well, uh, I had been ready to do the review, and I had checked, and they had shut down production for a period of time because of the invasion. Well, now I understand from their website that they are back up and running and ready to ship knives again, so they are available. So I thought it's high time I got this review done. Okay, what we'll do is we'll go down to my bench top. I'll go over the specifications for this knife. We'll talk about its design a little bit. Of course, you know, we're going to do some wood processing with it. All right, let's get started by going over some of the features and the design for the BPS Adventurer. So to begin, it is a full tang construction. The tang does extend right through to the end. It doesn't protrude past the end, but it does come to the end right there. It is a Scandi ground blade all along there, and it appears to have a micro bevel, but on close inspection, I think what they did is they just polished the edge a little bit. Now, whether that gives it a little bit of a convex or micro bevel on it, it really doesn't make any difference functionally it is every bit of a scandy grind to it and it is razor sharp yes i know razor sharp it's becoming an overused expression for what should be the standard for knives that are, are shipped to us now F not just functionally sharp or safely sharp but razor sharp and this one definitely is as is the 90 degree spine on back as you'll see it'll throw sparks quite readily from a ferrocerium rod actually the back is a little sticky i was just using it for scraping down some fat wood to start a fire so uh, it'll do that as well it has a walnut handle that is finished in a linseed oil or as the company refers to it as danish oil it does come with a full leather sheath with dangler i'll show you that a little bit more in a moment and uh, yeah as i mentioned in the opening it is made in the ukraine okay quickly let's have a look at the sheath and we'll put it aside do you know, for the cost of these knives, you can pay more than that just to get a good quality leather sheath. So when this sheath first arrived, I looked at it and said, yes, functional. And then I looked at it a little closer and said, you know what, that's more than functional. That's well done. It has a full welt that has been rounded off quite nicely. It is fully stitched all the way along the edge. It has a rivet at the top to prevent it from coming apart. It has a belt loop on the back that is riveted and at top and bottom and a dangler that is also riveted. Now, it's not especially wide, the belt loop or the dangler, but functionally, I only use the dangler anyway. And it is, and actually, it's a little longer than some danglers and it is exactly where I like to wear it. So uh, it's nicely finished. I'm not sure what they put on the outside, but I have been putting a little bit of snow seal on it over the last few months just to maintain its water proofness and it's shine a little bit. It does come with a ferrocerium rod in a little holder. I did add the piece of bungee cord, shock cord here to keep it in, and that ferrocerium rod does have a walnut handle as well. So more than functional, very nice looking. I think the price alone justifies the sheath, or the sheath justifies the price alone. All right, let's get back to the knife. So as I mentioned, this is the model Adventurer from BPS Knives. They have a number of models and some of them are, look very uh, similar to some other bushcraft knives out there. Well, there's only so many different models under the sun, but uh, this one is quite unique. I don't think I've seen anything else quite like this on the market. So the overall length for this knife, tip to pommel, is 10 inches or 255 millimeters. The blade length is 5.3 inches or 130 millimeters. The handle length then would be 4.7 inches or 120 millimeters. And the blade width or height right here is 1.2 inches or 30 millimeters. The blade thickness is 0.11 of an inch or 2.8 millimeters. It is made in 1066 high carbon steel and it is rated to be hardened to 56, 57 on the HRC scale. 
So the weight of the knife by itself without the sheath comes in at 5.7 ounces or 160 grams. With the sheath, the combination and the ferro rod, 10.2 ounces or 290 grams. So let's just talk about a few things that stand out to me about the knife itself and then I'll give you some close-ups. So I guess when it, oh, by the way, I did add a little tiny piece of bright green paracord as I often do on my belt knives more because if I lay it down, uh, not that I often do, but if I do or drop it in the snow, it makes it get easier to find. It also offers me somewhere to put my pinky if I want to use this as a very light chopper. And I think I can demonstrate that in a moment. And the handle is attached with uh, Allen screws or are they Torx? I did have this off. No, they're Allen. So there are Allen screws on both sides and and uh, so you can remove the, the handles or the scales for maintenance if you want. I'll be removing them afterwards uh, for another reason which I'll mention in a few minutes time. So as I mentioned, 1066 high carbon steel. Uh, you know, that seems to be a little bit on the lower end of the high carbon skills, steels compared to what we have seen in the market of recent. Uh, you know, most knives in the carbon steel are using 1095 or 5160 or uh, ADCR V2. There's a number of them out there that are being used. And uh, I wondered if this would be of a quality to match the, the knife itself, or are they just being, frankly, were they being cheap by using a less expensive steel? Well, the more I looked into 1066, what I discovered is it is actually quite similar in, comp in uh, makeup to 5160 spring steel. And I have a knife in 5160 spring steel that I would be, bet my life on. And it, it has taken a real beating, kept a tremendous edge. I put it into some wood that I should never have attempted to and had it bend at quite an angle and only to spring back fully into shape. Um, being a carbon steel, you do have to maintain them more than you would a stainless steel knife to prevent them from rusting. But other than that, there is absolutely no reason to turn your nose up at 1066 steel. Now, the other thing that might come uh, as a bit of a surprise or a bit of a, a question mark in your mind is it's got a 5.3 inch blade. Doesn't that qualify somewhere closer to a camp knife or survival knife? And yeah, I guess it could. And, and I guess this knife would for serve in both of those functions. That's a little longer than what I prefer for a personal belt knife, but I haven't found this to be so long that it's been uh, a nuisance or cumbersome at all to use. And even though it only has a 2.8 millimeter thick stock on the blade, that blade height and the fact that it's almost completely that full thickness until it reaches the Scandi grind means that this is plenty strong, plenty tough for all the tasks that you're likely to use a knife of this design for. I have no hesitation to baton through a reasonable size piece of wood and uh, yeah I, I haven't found it to be a problem. In fact I like the light weight that this knife provides. It just seems to be easier to carry, easier to manage in my hands when I'm doing carving tasks. And you know, you start to appreciate after having carried heavy knives that when you start using lighter weight knives, uh, you probably don't want to go back to the heavy weight knives unless you have a specific reason. So let me just give you a few close-ups of the knife and then we'll get on to doing some demonstrations. So, hopefully that's focusing in. The uh, construction of the knife is such that it's a little rough along the spine, so they did grind it and leave it a bit unfinished there, but I think that's almost a necessity when you're trying to get that 90 degree edge. In fact, this actually has a bit of a burr. It actually catches on my fingernail, so you know that they did that with the intention of providing that 90 degree edge. However, it does carry on down the back of the handles as well, so it's a little bit unfinished looking there, but everything matches up. There is no displacement of the scales. Everything matches perfectly. So they took the time to do that and it gives it a nice finish. There's a nice size sharpening choil right here. The grind is even all the way up, right up, including to the tip on both sides of the blade. So there was quite a bit of care taken to do a good job in the production of these knives. So, you know, it's, it's, it's just 
a really good knife for the money. Now, I'll, I'll, I'll change that comment. It's a really good knife, regardless of what the cost is. It may not be as much of a show knife as some of the other knives that I own, but functionally, this will match any of the other knives that I own quite easily. Here's something else, a little detail. Round it off right here where the grips or the scales meet the blade. And that makes it quite comfortable for putting my thumb there in either reverse grip or forward grip so I can get there and work with the carving nature or using this knife to carve and uh, know that it's going to be comfortable for extended use. One thing I do want to say right now before we get into the demonstrations is I had said that I'm likely going to be taking these scales off at some point after this review. And the reason is that I will probably be putting some liners inside under the scales. And the only reason I'm doing that is to gain some extra width here because, of course, I have XL to double XL hands and I find this knife just a little bit thin, both thin in this direction and also in this direction. Plenty long enough. In fact, I've got some pommel protruding from the back of my hand, so it is plenty long enough. So I'll see whether or not putting some liners in this will uh, give me a, just a little bit more girth on the knife, making it a little bit more comfortable for me to hold on to for extended periods of time. 99% of the people are not going to have an issue with that, but for me, it's just a little bit that if I can do it, and that's one of the nice things about this knife. It being a budget knife, not something that you broke the bank to purchase, you don't feel bad about doing modifications to it just to make those slight improvements, those slight personalizations to the knife. All right, let's get to doing some demonstrations with it. All right, so I cut myself a piece of wood out of my wood pile. This is Eastern White Pine. It's about 14 inches long. It is about two, two and a half inches in diameter. Quite dry. I think this will work for the demonstration that I can do with it. So what I'll do is I'll be tying it down into four quarters. I'll take one of those quarters for doing some feather sticking. I'll use one of the other pieces for doing some notching demonstrations. And I think the final test that we'll do with this is a bit of ferrocerium work. Okay, so just a comment on batani before we get started. Uh, this is as big a piece of wood that I'd likely baton with a belt knife. And not that this BPS Adventurer couldn't handle something bigger. I, I think it could quite easily. It's more because once I get bigger than this, that's when I reach for another tool, like an axe, a hatchet, or one of my large knives. But this is well within the wheelhouse of what it can be or the size of wood that it can be toned with. I think I'm, yeah, I'm still in frame. Not a lot in frame, but enough. Get back a little bit. Pine, spruce, a lot of them sometimes can be harder than you might think to baton. Even though they're a softer wood, the grain can go all over the place and there can be knots. But eventually it does split. It right, looks pretty good. Take this piece. And the grain is all over the place in this. I don't know if you can see that, how twisty that is. But, and we think we can still make this work. All right, I have four pieces of wood. Looking them over to see which might make the best of the feather sticks ones. Uh, I think we're gonna go with this one. There is a little bit of a knot at the bottom, but I think I can still make that work. Get into position here. Trying to work with the grain and the edge of the knife. Just going to take my time so I can establish a few curls that won't fall off. And sometimes they do. And if that happens, no big deal, right? Just pick them up, collect them up, add them to your pile. I seem to be losing almost as many as I'm keeping here today for some reason. That's all right. Some woods will curl better than others. 
this is gliding through the wood, but I'm not getting the curls. Try some angle cuts. Angling the blade will often curl. All right, and how about some really fine little ones? Well, I wouldn't call this my best demonstration of feather sticking. But feathers, feathers nonetheless. I think I'll do another one uh, and show that in a, as well, which one of these is going to be. All right, let's work with this guy. <laughs> Seems to be doing a little bit better. Yeah, now we're getting some curls, proper curls. I'm going to start a fire. I'd need more than one feather stick anyway. What I would say now as I do this is that Scandi grind and that little bit of a polished edge is making this so incredibly easy to slide through this wood. The trick is not to let it to bite in too deep to try to keep it just running down the surface of the wood. Let's see if I can get some really little ones. All right, that's a bit better, more of a feather stick, not the best, but uh, it still works as a feather stick. Let's see if I can do a little bit of notching. All right, so what I'm discovering is this piece of pine is a little wetter under the bark than I thought it was when I first picked it up. It's still pretty dry inside. I think I'm gonna split this down one more time and then we'll do some notching on that. Yeah, old wood. All right, let's try it this direction. All right, I think this is gonna be the best I have to work with. So, notches, the simple L7. If you were going to make a tent stake, you're gonna look for an L7 and a point on the other end. This is not gonna be a tent stake. Let's see if I can do a little bit better job of splitting that out, because this is not the best wood to be demonstrating with. All right, that's gonna, that's a bit better. Yeah, that'll work a little bit better. Very good. Okay, so what are we gonna do? Let's start with the point and we'll put the point on this end so I can just work it down like this. It didn't take long to create a functional point on the end of the stick. Let's go to the other end very quickly, create a L7 notch. So two ways of doing this. One would be just to do it with hand pressure and the other one would be to do it with the baton just to work in the stop cut. Very rough, very rudimentary tent peg, but I think there's enough of a demonstration in creating a tent peg to show what a knife is capable of without spending too much more time on it. All right, let's do a demonstration of the ferrocerium rod. So my preferred way of starting fires when I have it, of course, is birch bark. It's something we have a lot of, and it's hard to improve upon nature's best fire starter. I'll feather stick and spark the smallest feathers, but only when I need to. If I have birch bark or fatwood, 
those are the ones that I will go to first. Our cerium rod. See if I can get a clean spot. Yeah, I'd say that'll work. And that's how you use this knife with a ferrocerium rod to its best effect. All right, let's close up with a few comments. All right, the BPS Adventurer made in the Ukraine. A few closing comments. And I had said in one of the earlier segments that this is not just a great knife for the money. This is a great knife overall, regardless of the price. Now, true, it doesn't have the refinements of a custom knife or some of the higher end production knives, but there is absolutely nothing that I could see about this knife that would deter me from purchasing it, other than, for me personally, just the grip size, and that is about all. Yeah, you know, I, I don't think I could recommend this knife enough as far as a maybe your first real true bushcraft knife or maybe your one and only that you purchase. This is definitely the best bang for the buck on the market today. And I had mentioned the 1066 high carbon steel and my initial concerns around the edge. Well, uh, batoning wood like pine may not seem very hard, but there are knots in it and batoning, batoning hardwood. You know, yes, I have run this down uh, ceramics when I get it home and then I run it across a strop. Nothing. Just perfection all the way along its edge. I have not had any issues with the steel on this at all. I would not hesitate to recommend this to anybody. Okay. Sounds like I did, gave it a glowing report, and I think maybe I did. So often I'll find something about a knife that I think could be improved upon, and I guess the only thing I could find about this knife I'd like to see a little bit better, and it's not for everybody, it's just for me, again, is the grip. But I think most of the people who purchase this knife are gonna find it plenty big in the hand, and a good size overall camp knife, survival knife, but in my, my opinion, an ideal bushcraft knife. Oh, one thing I failed to mention about it is, because of the thin stock of this, it is still reasonably thin enough to do food prep with. I have used it for cutting meat, and normally a scanty grind, especially the thicker stock blades, don't do a very good job. They kind of crush things rather than slice them. And this one is still thin enough that it will do the job. So if you're looking at something that crosses over between a wood processor and a, a meat preparation or food processor, you know, this will still do the trick. And when you factor in that quality leather sheath that it came with, yeah, it, it, it just is. It really just is the best knife for the money on the market today. Okay, a couple things about purchasing this knife. So before coming out, I went to Amazon to see about its availability. Yes, you can purchase it on Amazon, but I recommend that you look elsewhere because I think the uh, relative few of these that are on the market right at this moment has caused Amazon to push their prices up much higher than they should be. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you two other places to look for this knife. I'll give you the links directly to the factory in the Ukraine for BPS knives. And the other one is their Etsy website. And Etsy is a relatively new thing to me. And I know you're saying, well, you know, what took you so long, Mark? But yeah, I found them on Etsy at a much more reasonable price than they are on Amazon. But you can get them directly out of the Ukraine sent by BPS knives from there. So yeah, I will give you all the information on this knife that I have, including all the specifications for it in the video description below. But if you have any questions or any comments on this knife or any of the other knives in the series on budget bushcraft knives, please put those in the comments section below as well. But until next time, get out and explore and take that path less traveled because it will make all the difference. Bye for now.